In the 80s, during the video game console wars, if you will, obviously the biggest contenders were Nintendo and Sega, but there were other entries into the market, and the biggest, most notable one, probably, uh, was NEC, who in 1987, working with Hudson, which was a Japanese video game developer of some note at the time, released the PC Engine, which got released here in the U.S. in 1989 as the TurboGrafx-16. I don't have a TurboGrafx-16, but I do have this guy here, the PC Engine Duo R. This is a late model from Japan, which integrates uh, what they call the CD-ROM-ROM, -ROM, which is not a mistake. That actually is what they called the CD-ROM add-on. The original PC Engine was actually quite small. It wasn't anywhere near this size because it didn't take video game cartridges. It actually took these. Uh, this is a Hue card, and it looks like it's going to be a CD, but if I open this, you'll see that in here there's actually just this card, and it's actually based on, I think, a type of sort of smart card, like a flash card that was used in Japanese payphones, and you just open this here and slide that out, and there's the new one, and the entire console, the original console, was only about yay big. It was a, almost no bigger than like a, like a Discman. And when they released it in the United States as the TurboGrafx-16, they made it about this size, uh, but there was no CD-ROM add-on. It was just all empty space because they thought Americans wouldn't like a console that small. And nonetheless, it never was a really big hit here. Um, I don't even know that it was a big hit in Japan, but nonetheless, there were some good games for it. And sometime last year, my girlfriend got an SD card reader for the other one we have, so I decided finally uh, to sit down and try and seriously play through a PC Engine game. I picked East 3, which was an action RPG from Nihon Falcom, which was pretty well known for making quality stuff in like the early RPG era, uh, and, and I just went at it, and I finished the game. And it was fun, but I found the controller for the PC Engine to be excruciating to use. It's funny, because NEC made the very intelligent decision, or maybe Hudson did, of basically cloning the NES gamepad, which very few other companies had realized was the correct thing to do. Every type of game controller that preceded the NES gamepad was pretty much unusable garbage, so I think that cloning it was a brilliant idea on NEC's part. Um, the problem is, I mean, at least from my perspective, that I find the NES controller to be universal. I, I can play games on this just forever, and I'll never get tired of it. It's, it's just invisible in my hands. I love this controller, and obviously a lot of other people loved it too, but this one makes me cramp up after five minutes. And it got even worse when I finished playing East 3, and I put it down for a day, and then I went back to play East 4, and like the minute I picked the thing up, I was immediately in pain. It was just really uncomfortable, and I wasn't really sure why, because they look exactly identical. I mean, everything is in just about the same places. It is quite a bit wider, but it doesn't seem like that should make a difference. It does seem to me like the controls are maybe like a sixteenth of an inch lower on the NEC gamepad, so maybe that's enough just to throw off the just the perfection of the whole layout? I don't know, but either way, this thing's just agonizing to use, and so I really wasn't able to move on to another game. I tried, but I just instantly ran out of stamina. So this was frustrating to me, but I thought, you know, if these are so similar, there's got to be a way to convert one into the other, so I, I went looking for some solutions. The only difference between these two controllers is the NEC pad has these turbo switches on it, which are not actually necessary. The original pad for the machine didn't have those, so I can lose those and not cry over it. And I was certain that the rest of it was electrically capable of being converted, but I didn't want to open this up and change the circuitry out. So I thought, well, I'll do the thing that everybody does now, and I'll get an Arduino. So I got an Arduino, and I went through the process of learning how to interpret the signals from the NES gamepad and convert them into the PC Engine gamepad, and I spent about two, three days on that. And it didn't work, and it wasn't worth the pain, so I threw that away, and I threw the whole project in a drawer and forgot about it for eight months. So finally, a couple weeks ago, I decided to give this a shot again, and I just completely ignored the Arduino approach, and I just googled convert NES controller for PC Engine, and I found a post from 1996 on, on some Usenet board, and then I found a webpage where someone had taken photos where they'd done the conversion themselves, and so I tried doing it myself, and, and it actually worked. Um, I was able to convert this pad right here to work on a PC Engine. You can see it's got the PC Engine's funky 8-pin plug on there, and, and I can plug it into this thing, and, and it goes... Just fine. See, from an electrical perspective, this was a trivial project. It's it's actually just a single chip uh, that you have to install in here and then just wire up to the board. I mean, it's it's kind of tedious, but not too bad. But the problem is it's it's literally physically thicker 
than the NES gamepad is because there's a circuit board and a chip in there. And it turns out that if I'd read the documentation for the project a little more thoroughly, I would have learned that there's this clever trick you've got to do where you flip the chip over and install it upside down in the, in the perf board and yada, yada, yada. I didn't want to do it, and I also thought that it was a pretty, uh, what's the word, inelegant way to do it. Uh, I thought, I can improve on this. Electrically speaking, these controllers are based on fairly similar technology. Uh, if I lift up this board here in the NEC controller, you'll see that for each of the buttons, there's a pair of carbon pads, and then these rubber things sit underneath the actual controls. And when you press on one, it just bridges the pads and connects them. So these are basically just a bunch of, of push buttons. And then this chip on the back, I think it's this one here, uh, takes those signals and it converts them into a format it can send down the wire to the console. Now this isn't actually a microcontroller or anything. This is a simple off-the-shelf 7400 series logic chip. Uh, it's effectively just a four-pin relay that switches back and forth between sending either the status of these four buttons or the status of these four buttons. And that's it. It just sends the first four, then the other four, over and over and over using a clock signal from the console. So there's four pins on here that carry buttons and then a clock signal and, and not a whole lot else. The other chip on here is just responsible for doing the turbo controller stuff, so when you turn these switches on, it just pulses the other switches, so it's actually completely unnecessary, and we can build one of these without implementing that. I don't want to open this NES controller up yet, but I can show you, this is the board from another one, and you can see the same thing is going on, it's just got the four carbon pads, um, these are actually carbon onboard resistors, uh, a thing I'd never seen before. Uh, and then uh, there's just a single chip on here. This one, however, is not a 4-bit switch like this one is. It's actually a shift register, uh, which in practice means that it essentially sends the status of each button one at a time down to the NES. So the console sends a clock signal, and every time that clock signal switches from on to off, it sends the status of the next control. So although these are both effectively 8-button controllers with very simple circuitry, they're nonetheless using completely incompatible protocols. So I have to convert between this protocol and that protocol, and unfortunately it's not as simple as just taking this single chip out and putting that one in. I wish it were, uh, but everything's obviously wired completely differently. So what's going on in here is that this board is connecting the inputs and outputs of the chip to the appropriate locations on the circuit board. It's, it's, there's nothing special going on there. Uh, there's a few resistors to set some levels correctly, but it's, it's very, very simple. You just can't put it straight in the original board. You've got to have another circuit board here. But if you're doing it by hand, you get this complete mess of, of wires and uh, solder joints going everywhere. So it's, it's really inconvenient. But nonetheless, I did set this up and try it, and it felt a lot better. So I thought, okay, I would like other people to be able to do this, and maybe even do a better one myself, especially if this one stops working. So I figured the best way to do that was to take this circuit board design, which is a perfectly good one, and compress it down into something smaller. And the easiest way to do that was to use surface mount components. See, this guy here is the surface mount variant, or in fact, this is a, about eight surface mount versions of the chip that is inside here. And as you can see, you know, you can fit about two of these or three of these in the space of one of those chips. So if I put this on a circuit board, uh, it's gonna take up a lot less room and it should fit in there much more nicely. Now I'd seen printed circuit boards designed before and I knew that other people were getting them online from a couple different companies. So I figured this was something I could do. Uh, I even used to work at a place that was making its own printed circuit boards. Uh, so I'd seen the design process, but even though they were being fabricated elsewhere. So I figured this was a possibility and I'd heard that the company you go through to get these usually if you're a hobbyist is somebody called Oshpark. Um, and I don't have any affiliation with them or anything. I just know the name. So I, I went and looked it up, and the prices looked quite reasonable. So I buckled down, and I, I got the open source utilities. There's a thing called KiCad or, or KiCad that's uh, you know open source software, and it's pretty messy, but I spent, I don't know, maybe six hours with it, and I was able to produce a design for a circuit board. So this is the original NES PCB with this one chip. Uh, this is the nasty hack job I did with some strip board that I had to drill out so it wouldn't conduct in the wrong places and these big ugly solder joints and uh, this huge honk and chip and whatnot. And then here's this. You know, this is what I wanted in the first place. Uh, it's basically just replaces the chip with this little board here. It's actually thinner than the cable, so there's no real space constraint issues. Other than the fact that eight wire cables are really, really thick and it's very hard to find one. I still have not found one that actually fits very well in the NES chassis. Um, but if you 
squeeze it in there and put the case on and, and screw it down, you know, it works okay. But it did work. Um, I was able to, to play games with this a little bit, but it was kind of flaky. And I decided that might be because I, I actually kind of got the pads on here closer together than I intended because I had I'd never done this before. This is the first PCB I'd made in my life. Uh, after it, I use it for a little bit, uh, some of the buttons stop working. And I think these are just so close together that things are touching up there. So I made a second variant of this board which has the pads up there thicker and further apart for better isolation. And it also tapers down uh, at the other end here so that it's easier to get it in despite this post and another post that comes down here. Um, it wasn't necessary, but I figured if I was making another one, I might as well give it a little more clearance down there. So uh, in addition to that, the uh, bill of materials is now printed on the back of this. And the reason I printed the bill of materials on the back is because this is actually an open source item that you can have made for you by Oshpark by just going to the link in the description. This is not something I'm selling. Uh, you pay them $4.50 for three of these. There's no shipping costs. And you just need to get the other parts, which are the five components listed on the back here. It's four resistors and one integrated circuit. Altogether, I think it's like less than $1.50 of parts. You just have to solder them on here and install this in a gamepad, and you can have your own NES gamepad for the PC Engine. So this video is, is sort of a tutorial on how to install this in here. So your first step in modding your controller is going to be to open it up. You take out the uh, six screws here, and inside you'll find the circuit board, as I showed you earlier. Uh, and it's not held in by anything at this point, so you just pop it out. And then you've got to get this cable out of the strain relief here. And it's important when you go to reinstall this that you remember how this was installed into the strain relief. Because if your replacement cable will fit between those posts in the same orientation, that is the best way to strain relieve it, and it, it is a good idea. You flip this over, and your wires are coming through these holes here and terminating here. So you want to uh, desolder all of these and pull the wire out. And these could be kind of tricky because... For some reason, they, they seem kind of sticky in the holes. But the fortunate thing is you don't need to worry uh, really about being too rough with these unless you are hoping to return this to an NES controller someday. Because once you pull these wires out of here, you're never putting them back. The, uh, the mod does not use these holes. Then you have to desolder the IC itself. And that can always be a pretty perilous experience um, if you wet the solder first with, with new solder and or add good flux to it and then you use a soldering pump and you just make sure that you get good clearing on each of the holes uh, before you go to try and pull the chip out, you can definitely do it without damaging any of the traces. I would love to demo with this one, but this is my last spare controller, so I can't show you the entire process. So once you've got everything desoldered, you'll have this denuded board with no wires and no IC, and the next step is to get this board installed. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to put these pin strips uh, through the board and then install them into the NES PCB. But I found out when I do that, uh, it uh, has a tendency, not always, but it has a tendency to lift the pads off the NES board. You can just barely see that this one here got popped off. So this is not the right way to do it. Um, I'll show you the clever technique that my girlfriend suggested, however, because it actually works quite well. This is the original chip that was in this board. And if you've done a decent job of extracting it, you should have nice, clean legs on here. And if not, you can usually clean them up with a soldering iron to sort of run it up and down the legs a couple times. But uh, you're going to take that and you're going to drop it through the mod board. It doesn't matter which orientation because you're not actually going to use it. With the legs sticking out the bottom, you now take that and you put it over the NES PCB. And you sink the legs down into the holes in the NES PCB. As you can see, the legs are just barely coming through, but, you know, for a funky mod like this, that's okay. So your next step is just solder all these pins in place, and I'm just doing this on the table surface instead of in a helping hands jig or something, because I want to make sure that the pins are as deep into the holes as they can possibly be. Flux is optional, but as always, we'll make things work better. All right, so that's all soldered, and it looks like it's as close to the board as it can be. So the next thing we want to do is to solder all the pins on the top. So these are all soldered on the bottom, but they're not actually electrically connected to this PCB yet. So we need to go ahead and solder each one of these into place. <laughs> 
All right, there we go. So it's now soldered on both sides. And now we need to get this chip out of here. This chip is not actually going to do anything. It was just a way to get pins into these holes because I can't find a source for thinner pins than this. But these pins fit just perfectly. The usual recommendation is to clip them off right next to the chip itself. So that's the way I'm gonna do it. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to admit the soldering quality on some of these is not so hot. Uh, they didn't wet very well, but they're probably conducting. And I'm going to say you probably shouldn't try and touch this up because these are now no longer held in place by anything but the solder. So if, if you heat the solder up here, it's going to melt on the bottom as well, and that pin's going to fall right out. So as long as it's working, I wouldn't worry about it being a little messy or, or, or incomplete here. I think this is more than enough solder to do the job. So now we need to get the uh, components onto the surface mount pads. So there are two components uh, on this board. One is a 7400 series logic chip, uh, and the other one is a chip resistor. Uh, I bought a ton of them because they're not terribly expensive. Uh, I think they're like 30 cents a piece for, for each of these, something like that. So I'm going to get four of these chip resistors out. And these things are miserable to work with. Uh, they are, they're so tiny, they look like debris. Um, the chips are a, a little less unpleasant to work with. I've never done surface mount before, I should, I should point out. Um, I've soldered two of these boards now, and that's all the surface mount work I've ever done. So uh, this has been a learning experience for me. But uh, this guy here, which I am brazenly mishandling, is uh, the star of the show, obviously. And on this particular variant, this is a Texas Instruments variant. And I'll zoom in here. And so on this one, the white stripe at that end of the chip represents the uh, top end of it. So it should face towards the stripe on the board that says 1. And I don't know how other manufacturers uh, indicate that. It seems to be kind of inconsistent on surface mount parts. So uh, if you get the DigiKey part number that I put on the board, uh, then you will get this chip for sure, and you can rely on that. Soldering surface mount chips is, is a pretty wild experience, and apparently the most popular way to do it is something called drag soldering, which I've now tried a couple times, and I see why it's so popular. Uh, it does seem to work, so I'll show you uh, more or less how to do that, since I only sort of know how to do it. What we're going to do here is uh, we're going to flux it first. Flux is, is kind of essential for this. Uh, it's, it's a good idea, but optional for other things, but seems to be absolutely mandatory for surface mount work. I, I probably just massively overdid it there, but we'll survive. Uh, so I'm going to tin my, my soldering iron tip here. Let's get a little bit on there. And then I'm going to just nudge this thing. And then I'm just going to touch some solder onto uh, one of the pads up here. Okay, there we go. Yep, that looks pretty straight now. So now we're just going to get this other corner down here, and I need just a touch more solder. So that's more or less good. And so now we're, we're tacked. I think we might still be a little twisted, but there's nothing shorting, so I think we'll be okay. And apparently what we do now is we just put a, a little more solder on than we need on one of these pads. There we go. And then I'm just going to drag the tip down the row of contacts. And what that's ostensibly going to do is basically use surface tension to pull that solder along with me. And as you can see, it is distributing onto the pins and the pads. I don't know in an objective sense how, how good this is, you know, in, in terms of getting an, uh, an ostensibly perfect joint, but they're all connected and there's not going to be any great mechanical force in here. So I think that will do. Let's go ahead and rake that down there. So that's the IC and the IC is easy. Uh, it's actually these chip resistors that are going to be the most pain because you have to handle them. You just you cannot handle them with your hands. Um, you really have to use uh, the tweezers, and they just want to get away from you. And, and once they get upside down, it can be almost impossible to get them flipped back over. We're just going to put a dab of solder on... Oh, that was too much. On each of these pads. I am so bad at this particular part of it, but it, it functions. So uh, if you're better at surface mount soldering, I'm sure you can do a much nicer job than this. But this board is so barbarian in its design that it'll work anyway. So, so I'm just going to melt that and just set that guy down in there. Oops. And get it straightened up. There we go. Get that in there. There we are. It's way, way too much solder, and I don't know how to get it off. And there we go. 
Now, are these, I think the word is tombstoning, but no, it looks like they're pretty dirty, but they're still, they're flat against the board, so at least there's that. They're not very straight, but again, nothing's terribly precise here, so I think we're okay. Sure would be nicer looking if it was made by a pick and place, but uh, that will function, I know, because the other one I made was a lot uglier and it functioned. So our next step here is going to be to get the cable attached. Uh, this is a 8-pin mini DIN male-to-male -male cable and you can get these as Macintosh serial cables in some cases and I believe they'll consistently have all eight conductors inside of them but you do need to get one that's eight conductor so they're not terribly popular or useful these days so you won't find them at most stores you're gonna have to get them online somewhere and if you see one that's just really 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 thin even though it has the right connectors, it might not have all eight wires inside, so be careful about that. However, you do want to get one that's as thin as possible. The original NES cable was noticeably thinner than this one. This one will work, but it's a huge pain getting it into the case, and it's just, if you could find one with a thinner gauge wire, you will have a better time. I have not found one yet. I don't know if they exist. So I'm going to cut the end off here. I need bigger clippers for that. I'm going to cut the end off here. So we're going to need uh, about this much of it stripped, maybe a little bit more for convenience. So I'm going to go ahead and do this with my wire cutters here, but you might want to use like an actual, you know, cable stripper. If you've got one for doing like Cat5, for instance, you might get a cleaner cut. Okay, there's a shield wire, uh, or I should say drain wire, I guess is what they're called. Lose that. And now you're going to want to strip every one of these. You only need about that much, about maybe a quarter inch. Is that more? Is that three-eighths of an inch? Not very much, anyway. Just a, a small amount. Uh, it just needs to be big enough to lay on this pad. So, in fact, uh, even that is too long. We really want it just a little bit shorter than that. But I'll trim it after I tin it. Okay, I'm going to fan these out here. And none of them got too terribly bent while I was getting the rest stripped. So, we're just going to go hog on these. And by hog, I mean we're going to flux them and tin them. All right, and we're tinned, so now we have to do the most miserable part, which is we gotta get a pin out. Pin four, black. Pin one, yellow. Pin seven, brown. And obviously pin eight is purple. So having done that, the only thing we have left to do is simply solder these wires down to the pads here. Uh, according to this pinout, and it's a uh, pin one uh, corresponds to uh, pin one here. So we're going to start with yellow. So I'm going to go ahead and just put some solder down on the pad to begin. I'm going to go ahead actually and just uh, prepare each one of these. Pin one. There's pin two, pin four, pin six, and there's pin eight. And that's it. The mod's done. We're just going to get the original chassis here and uh, make sure all the rubber pads are where they started and set this in here. All right, so I'm going to curl this around here, and then I don't think it's going to quite go through those strainer leaves. So I'm just going to put it through the one and then out through the hole here like that and it looks pretty clean i think i'm gonna have trouble getting the case on just because of the thickness of the cable it's much bigger than the nes cord was but let's see if i can get it on there this guy here is going to get in the way of the cable itself it doesn't run into this board but it runs into the cable so if i push this up like that and then slip this on i think it will go there we go this will work the only problem is that it's t actually too big for the strain relief. So although this is electrically perfectly feasible, I'm not going to be able to drive the screws down all the way. So when doing this yourself, you might need to actually experiment, like get a couple different uh, cables until you find one that fits, um, or possibly even uh, use a Dremel and uh, open up that hole a little bit. I haven't tried, but that seems like it should be practical. So let's go ahead and uh, get the screws in this thing. Now it's important if you're uh, assembling one of these 
uh, to actually put the screws in before you go to test it. Even if you're not ready to call it done, even if you're not entirely certain that it's going to work, uh, it's still important to put the screws in uh, at least somewhat because if you don't, then the rubber pads will not be uh, retained correctly and you'll go to test it and you'll think the buttons don't work, but they actually do work. There just isn't enough tension on the assembly to make them work. So you got to get these in here at least most of the way, even if you're just testing it. All right. And uh, uh, despite the uh, <laughs> cable not quite clamping down all the way, this is complete and it can be used. So let's go ahead and uh, hook it up and see how it works. Okay, so uh, here's Bomberman, and if I hit start, it skips the intro. We can start a game. Okay, let's try our arrow keys, and that's working. Drop a bomb, that's working. We can pause, and yeah, sure enough, everything is functioning. I can't test the B key or the select key, but it's really unlikely that they aren't working. I've done this enough times that uh, I figure, uh, unless I just got a dry solder joint in there, like a completely dry one, then I can be pretty confident that everything is functioning. I, I just don't have a, a gamepad test suite handy right now. So this was uh, a successful mod. So the <laughs> weirdness here is a little unfortunate. The uh, mod I did on the other one used much thinner cable. I did not realize just how thick this was. So I might swap this one out for that one. But, uh, you know, if you're careful and you get one that's this thin, uh, the case will actually go together. It'll be like like nothing ever happened. And uh, this is a, a functional mod that will turn the old familiar NES controller into a much better, in my opinion, gamepad for the PC Engine. So if you're interested in that for yourself, uh, check out the description for a link to the Oshpark listing where you can get the board itself. Uh, and links to the DigiKey parts. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you thought, and thanks for watching.